And good afternoon from Pittsburgh. And I hope you are all well and safely warm uh, because it's just gone very cold again. And it's snowing. It's ridiculous. We had beautiful weather for a couple of days. Temperatures were mild. One could sit outside and drink a cup of coffee and look at the view. And all the snow went, and now it's back. One of the things that one should hello there, Marlene. Lunch with the Greeks. What more could you wish for? It would be much nicer if one were having lunch in Greece. But we'll make do with what we've got. Hello, David. Oh, yes. Now, poor old UK has had, and Ireland indeed, had two storms, one straight after the other. And devastation everywhere, and trees ripped out of the ground, and roofs off. And I saw a thing on them. Um, hello, David, um, uh, and hello, Shelley. Um, yeah, this too will pass, rather rather like kidney stones. Um, but it was it. Uh, I, I, there was a thing I saw on Facebook of a church steeple, and the top of it literally being blown off by the storm. So, for all of my friends in the UK and in Ireland. I do, I do feel your pain, um, and I hope that the storm has passed you and left you safe, because it can be pretty terrible out there. Um, here, we haven't had that. We just have warm, then cold, then warm, then cold, and snow, and then rain, and then snow. It's just so boring. So I come back to my original point. I think it was Marlene said it. Lunch with the Greeks, but much rather lunch in Greece right now in the warm. It would be gorgeous. Can't do it. So we put up with where we are and uh, we'll just talk about Greek theatre. And this being the fourth of our outings with Greek theatre and a surprise for you, a tiny surprise at the end concerning the same topic. We'll wait a couple more minutes for latecomers to arrive. Um because there's always the odd late cover. I've noticed that once I actually start, people turn up. Hello, Debbie. You're on time. Well done. Um, hello, Grace. I hope you didn't get too damaged by the storm. Um, oh, I think Grace is in Ireland. There's James in Crafton. Um, near, yeah, we're actually we're, we're heading towards our, our 100th. I think we're 80-something at the moment. Um, <clears throat> which seems a lot. Originally, the plan was that we would do five. Now when, uh, we're, we're heading to, uh, certainly heading towards 90. Though we'll hit 100 this year. Um, and of course, every webinar that we've done is available to you on the website or go to our YouTube channel. You can see any webinar that we've done in the past. And speaking of the website, it's been renewed. So uh, people who found the website confusing and difficult, the new revised, renewed, and all improved website is now up. And by the time we finish this webinar, I'm going to go and have a look at it. But apparently all the stuff that has to be transferred from one program to another is happened, as has happened. There's a few tiny things to, to tie up. But the all new website is up and running, and I do hope you enjoy it. And if you have any comments about it, always feel free to email us. Uh, as you can with comments about anything that we say, do, or fail to say and do, just email us and we'd be delighted to respond. But anyway, as I say, the uh, the new improved, which is, of course, a contradiction. If it is new, how could it be improved? Anyway, the new improved website is now up and running and we are much relieved. Hello, Helen. Thank you so much for being just a little Helen's great loyal supporter. We love her. And uh, uh, and all of you, all of you who indeed tune in regularly every week. And I don't just mean those of you who tune in live every week, but there's an awful lot of people who this isn't a suitable time for, but who go regularly and loyally and check us out on the YouTube channel. To, to you all, thank you. Um. So how are we doing? Um, oh, yeah, we've gone to a clock or a minute past. Uh, now, to begin with, first, I must say a special thank you um, to um, Leonie Hasek. Why I hear you cry? Well, because she has sponsored this week's webinar. Leonie, thank you so much. 
um, makes a huge degree of difference to us because even though the websites are free and will always be free, uh, or the, the, the webinars, um, it still costs us to produce them. And so each, we, we reckon that it averaged out over the year with various guests, because when we have guests, they are paid. When we have performers, they are paid. The use of the um, StreamYard channel has to be paid for. So it costs about $250 for each webinar to go out. We don't charge you for it. They will always be free. It's part of our educational service, but we do need to get them sponsored. And so Leonie, thank you very much for sponsoring this week. It makes a huge difference to us. And if anybody's interested in sponsoring, check us out, send us an email. We'll get back to you. $250 is the cost of a sponsorship. Any questions, there you have it. Marketing at pittheater.org. So part four of our little exploration of the influence of the Greeks. Uh, so I sort of subtitled for myself, if, if last week was It's All Greek to Me, this year, or this week rather, I'm asking the question, so what's that to me? So, okay, the Greeks, they wrote their plays two and a half thousand years ago, so what? Uh, they're very old. But the point I'm trying to make struggling to make over these four programs is that when we talk about Greek theatre, we're talking about theatre, certainly Western theatre. And that as I explored through these last three weeks, the influence, the everything about theatre as we know it and understand it can be traced back to the Greeks and beyond because we did examine if the Greeks are at the foundation of Western theater, what was the foundation of Greek theater? And it is the foundation of all art. It is the principle of storytelling. We tell our lives. History is storytelling. We all know the axiom, history is written by the winners. Uh, very often true, but the all accounts, all historic accounts, and those people in universities who spend entire lifetime searching and researching tomes and documents are attempting always to tell us the story of where we've been, where we came from, and how we got here. It's all storytelling. And art is another aspect of that, where the artist, and what, a, what their art form is, it can be theater, it can be no, novels, poetry, painting, sculpture, dance, whatever, music, is always an attempt to try to explain to ourselves who we are and how we got here and how we messed up in the past and how we'll probably mess up in the future. Um, for instance, there's an interesting examination at the moment going on where they're looking at comparisons with regard to pandemics. And after the great black death in Europe, suddenly massive inflation took place. Suddenly there weren't enough workers to go around. Suddenly wages had to go up. Does this sound familiar? History repeats itself. Life repeats itself. Art is a representation of the fact, uh, by the dictum I've often uh, used before, the only thing that changes is fashion and technology. People remain the same. And we're living in a particular moment in time when that is absolutely true. We're living in a moment politically um, where a European war could break out and for very similar reasons and in similar ways that broke out in 1939. So it's tragic and it's appalling, but it's human nature. Anyway, as come back to the initial point. Um, when I say Greek theater, I mean all, th I mean, even the word theater is Greek. It comes from the ancient Greek. Um, the place where we perform comes from a, it's derived from the a Greek phrase, which mean, or theatron, a place for viewing, a place where you can see it, um, which is deeply important because theater is not merely about the word. It is about the visual. It is about the look, watching. And as, as, as we, we explained in, in a previous webinar, the Greek poet didn't simply want, uh, it, it, the written word was superseded by the spoken word. The poet wrote in order to perform, in order to uh, present verbally. 
what he was writing about, and that slowly grew into the development of, of performers to perform the poet's words aloud, visually. And as plays began to develop, the introduction of auxiliary characters, the introduction of the chorus, as I mentioned, I think last week, the introduction of the third character to create discord, to create debate, to take sides. And so the evolution of drama became, it's, it's very clear in the evolution of Greek playwriting. So, as we know, for over two and a half thousand years, uh, these early writers of theatre um, influenced the their work influenced the developments that came out of it. Um, now, <clears throat> writers change, obviously; they die, new ones are born, and the world, being the world, because fashion does change. Uh, finds new looks, new devices, new methodologies in order to present theatre or any other art form. For instance, Leonardo da Vinci would have been fascinated by the idea of using pixels of light to create art. Um, anybody who's seen that exhibition of Van Gogh's work, uh, you know, the, a man who could put things onto canvas in a way that no other ever could, we now can see in as a light show. Um, so fashions change and technology changes, but the message comes from the human mind and human nature continues very much as it did right at back to the time of Sophocles and Euripides and, and, and uh, Aeschylus. We may stage it in new and innovative ways. We may present our art in a new way, but the story it tells us of those times, two and a half thousand years ago and before, and the, the, the people involved in those stories is still as true today as it was then, because the Greeks wrote about people, and people don't change. Human nature is pretty much a constant. So how does that affect modern writing? How, do, how has that affected writing down the years? How, how has that simple fact uh, been addressed by other writers and why are other writers still so deeply affected by what the, the Greeks dealt with because I believe and again everything I tell you may be wrong everything I tell you is what I think on those rare occasions that I do um, because human nature doesn't change the human story doesn't really change we repeat history as I just demonstrated plagues and wars have been happening right through human history and very often and rather sadly we tend to respond to them in exactly the same ways so i talked last week about aristophanes for instance the father of comedy and the development of comedy as an art form a comedy is not simply about being funny it is a methodology to present something a message in exactly the same way the tragedy presents a message. It's a way of telling a story in exactly the same way that tragedy tells a story. But comedy does it from a different perspective. It uses very often ridicule. It uses satire. It uses jokes. And what makes a joke funny? A joke is funny usually because you can see the rather absurd truth of it. I'll come to that right at the end. Um, Satire is a wonderful way to attack without actually causing physical damage. Um, comedy as a form is a method of expressing the way humanity behaves. And if you look at the plays of, uh, of Aristophanes, you see that evolving through the progression of his writing, looking at the absurd nature. He was called the father of comedy because he influenced, he probably influenced more writers than any of the other Greeks. Uh, by the time we get to Rome, by when the time that the, the Roman civilization dominated and the Greek civilization had been sort of swept aside, they were still writing similar plays. And you had the writings of, of Plautus and Terence, um, who um, they used comedy both as entertainment, but also as a degree, uh, to a certain degree, 
um, they used it for social commentary as well. Um, when you write a, when you write plays, for instance, about masters and slaves, you can write about the tragedy of that, but you can also write about the absurdity of it, and that very often the servant and the master, uh, wisdom resided not in the master but in the servant, knowledge, experience, practicality rested with the servant rather than the master because the master is dependent on the servant very often more than the servant is dependent on the master and that is brilliant subject for satire that is a truly sort of given by the gods to the artist to say to humanity look how stupidly you behave and this notion of condemning social injustice, which, which was picked up in Rome by, by, by Plautus and, and, and by Terence and by other writers after them, stayed as a part, as an intrinsic part of the development of theater writing throughout history. And if you want a perfect example of it, and I'm going to use Irish writers this week because, well, let's face it, we are the Irish and classic theater. Um, Oscar Wilde who was a Greek scholar who studied Greek and he when he was at Oxford at Magdalen College, um, his degree was in what was then called Greats, which was Greek and Latin. Um, and he was, uh, a, he could speak ancient Greek conversationally. I think I've mentioned before in a webinar where he, uh, he came in for a, 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 a verbal examination and talked for about 10 minutes to the examiners, but he wasn't, he was, he was talking about the bad weather and why he was late and apologizing and all of that, but he was doing it in ancient Greek. So they just give him a pass on it. But um, being a Greek scholar, if you look at his comedies, they are always about, um, they're always a satire. They are always, they were, they were a rather savage satire about English aristocracy and its stupidity, not its, its not its, it's, it's stupidity in terms of being peckamorons, but it's stupidity in its behavior and its attitudes and its sense of superiority. It's hubris, if you like. So that when you look at the plays of Oscar Wilde, there is a deep Greek influence because underneath the comedy of the play, the satire of the play, the absurdities and the ridiculousnesses of the play, there is always a tragedy in hiding, always within his plays there is a tragedy going on under the surface. So that's one example of what I'm, I'm referring to. For instance, again, out of Plautus and, and Terence, and uh, if, you, if you go back to the 16th century, you have the development of the Commedia, the Commedia dell'arte, but the, the Commedia as a concept, as an aspect of theater that was satiric and absurdist in its own way, um, and was incredibly popular, for, not just in Italy, but throughout the whole of Europe. Um, and it was built, Commedia plays were built on a range of stock characters who would wear masks. And the mask would indicate to you, apart from the acting, the mask would indicate to you the nature of the character, who the character was, what the character was. You didn't have to stop and keep working out who's who, the way you do in so many television-based dramas nowadays. You knew because that character was presented. It was a Greek invention, a Greek tradition, this principle that by the use of the mask, the audience didn't have to worry. They knew. They could simply follow the story watch the absurdities. Um, and also the Commedia developed this, this notion of the, if you like, uh, the joke, um, the sort of classic regular routines, regardless of the play, there would be certain characters who would follow certain rules and patterns to be funny. Um, they had a term for it and it's just gone straight out of my head. Um, but it was a, a kind of comic routine that would immediately be recognized by the audience because of the character playing it. And if you don't understand that, then I will simply say, look at Laurel and Hardy. 
Look at Charlie Chaplin or Buster Keaton. Look at the Marx Brothers. Marx Brothers, perfect example. But all of these guys, and by the way, most of them tried out their routines in vaudeville, in front of live audiences, until the timing was completely impeccable. Chaplin didn't need to. He was just a genius, and same with Buster Keaton. But Laurel and Hardy did vaudeville, and the Marx Brothers certainly did vaudeville. And they were working out routines. You almost could smell the routine coming from the way they would set it up, from the way they would react to one another. But this goes back to pure comedia. And this goes back all the way through Roman theater, back to the Greeks, back to this notion of certain characters having certain characteristics that were deeply human, that were based on human reaction to any given situation. So when you see Charlie Chaplin's tramp, when you see the, 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 the unsmiling face of Buster Keaton facing absurd and ridiculous adventures, when you watch Laurel and Hardy doing everything, so many times they repeated the same gag over and over again in different situations, and you laugh at it because what you're laughing at is you, because you recognize it. And that comes from Arist all the way back to Aristophanes. It is uh, the nature of human stupidity. Uh, even the concept of, uh, you know, the concept of pantomime, which we don't really have here in, 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 in the States, but you get a lot of, especially in the UK and Ireland, um, of, of classic, well-established, clearly recognized characters. Um, the most famous one within, within Comedia probably would be the character of Harlequin. Um, but these stock characters, as I say, th th they had a sort of a fixed social position. Uh, there was the silly old man. There was the, 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 the wicked servant or the devious servant. There was the pumped up soldier or, or potentate or whatever. All stock characters and that all can be traced back without any question to the Greeks. Interestingly, the, the, uh, if you will recall, the Greek, the development of Greek theatre was very much associated with a particular festival, um, the Feast of Dionysus. And so it started as a religious observance that became an entertainment. Commedia probably was related to Carnival in Venice, which was also religious observance initially. Um, it was between, uh, looking at my notes, between Epiphany and Ash Wednesday. Um, and this kind of celebration of life, this celebration of fun, this celebration of enjoyment. And rather in the same way that drama developed out of the, 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 the feast or festival of Dionysus, Comedia developed out of that that celebration, the Carnivale. Shakespeare even noted that. Shakespeare took that image, just as a sidebar issue, um, in, um, in uh, Merchant of Venice, because the masking um, and masking you know, to attend a mask, a masked ball, or to wear the mask, part of the Commedia tradition, going back to the Greek, Greek tradition is exactly the thing that Shakespeare stole, and I use the word quite seriously, Shakespeare stole um, to enable Jessica to escape from her father Shylock by wearing a mask. Um, so that's comedy. Tragedy as a concept, as an entity. Let's talk about what that word actually means. Um, there is we must never confuse a tragedy with a disaster. There's an old Irish joke. Um, if the entire Irish parliament of politicians fell into the river Liffey, that would be a disaster. If somebody pulled them out, that'd be a tragedy. Now, disaster is something that is large, impersonal. A storm is a disaster. Wildfire is a disaster. Floods and famine are disasters, but they are impersonal. They are huge. They will change the face 
of things. They will change the nature of things. They will change the face of the earth sometimes. When a comet hits us, or as it did to the dinosaurs, that was a disaster. But not a tragedy. Tragedy is something much more personal, human, individual. A, a fire that wipes out a large chunk of California is a disaster. There will be questions there. The individual, for the individual family who have worked and, and, and built a home and a place for their children, and that is lost and gone and they have nothing left, that is a tragedy. It's a very important distinction because the Greeks didn't write about disasters, they wrote about tragedy. It was about the personal experience. Shakespeare and his contemporaries, uh, and let us remember that these guys, when they went to school, they, they did study Latin and Greek. They could read Greek. Um, who was it said Green, I think it was. Was it Green or Bacon who said of Shakespeare, he has uh, little Latin and less Greek, untrue. He went through an English grammar school of the period and you studied Latin and Greek. And if you didn't learn it, you got beaten thoroughly. Um, so they could read the history. They could read the philosophy of the Greeks and the dramas of the Greeks, but they can read it in the original language. So it is reasonable to suppose that if Shakespeare and his contemporaries read the plays of Aristophanes or Euripides or whatever, read the philosophies. They read them in Greek. Today, very few of us have that ability, apart from the fact that we don't study ancient Greek, or very few of us do. Uh, we don't have the opportunity to read these works in the original language. Today, we have to read translations, rather like the Bible. Very few of us who, um, those who are adherents to the Judeo-Christian faiths only read the Bible in modern translations. And that leads to confusion. Being able to go back to the original is a wonderful, wonderful skill. Um, but, the effect that these Greek dramas had on these the, the modern uh, these modern writers of the Elizabethan period, of the Renaissance, of the rebirth of art, the renewal of art, the effect that the Greek dramas had on them, whether they read them in translation or whether they read them in the original, was huge. And they started to write a whole new series of very modern plays based on those same fundamental issues that the Greeks had addressed. Because the Greeks had examined, the poets had examined what is the human condition? What is human behavior? How does it work? And how, why don't we learn from it? And the modern writers of the Elizabethan period address these questions as well. And the one thing, I, to my mind, the one particular theme that fascinated them most was hubris. Um, because that is the strongest um, trait in the stupidity of human behavior. So out of that, you would, you know, and, and we know we have Sophocles, um, and, and Oedipus as the perfect example of hubris. But hubris is there constantly. The idea of, I am the only person who can fix this. I can put it right. I know what I'm doing. I am in control. Everything will be fine if you trust in me. Now, I'm not going to go into obvious political um, associations with that, but it was the same thing with Joseph Stalin and Adolf Hitler and Genghis Khan and just about every, um, every uh, 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 dictatorial ruler, even Julius Caesar was guilty of it. Um, and if you want to understand the depths of how ultimately futile hubris is, you have to read the poem Ozymandias um 
because that explains it quite quite brilliantly. I'm not going to read it. You'll have to go and look it up. But if you look at the play, I mean, you look at Shakespeare. If you look at, at King Lear, if you look at Richard III, you have perfect examples in the Greek sense, the Greek tragic sense of hubris. If you look at Lear, he simply sets up a person who believes absolutely in his own authority absolutely in his own power, absolute faith and belief in his own kingship. But he has a very important lesson to learn. Hubris will lead him astray. Hubris will lead him into the belief that he is godlike. And he must learn the lesson that to have authority, you must take responsibility. And it destroys him. If you look at Richard III, a belief a so be, so believing in his own ability, his own strength, his own wit, his own cleverness, that brings him to the throne. And that self-belief deludes him that others might be able to defeat him. But Richard III is an example of hubris. You go to Marlowe. If you look at Tamburlaine, how great a thing it is to be a king and march in triumph through Persepolis. Tamburlaine is a perfect example of hubris. So is Faustus. Marlowe's Faust, a perfect example of, I have control of the demon. I have control of Mephistopheles. I am in control. I've just had to do a small deal on the side regarding my soul. But I have power, I have control. But he will learn that this power is temporary hubris this notion of tragedy is to do as the greeks realized it to do with the fact that we are self-deluding and sometimes that self-delusion is a little bit more complex than the very simple i am i am wonderful everybody should do what i say Sometimes that self-delusion comes from uh, uh, a sense of self-righteousness. And that also comes back to investigate it. And in his play Merchant of Venice, which is not a tragedy, it's technically a comedy, but rather like with Oscar Wilde, under, underlying the absurdities of the play, there is a tragedy going on. Shylock is a tragic victim. We talk about tragic heroes. Shylock is a tragic victim, and he is living in an absurd world, a world that is just crazy, a world of prejudice and a world of hatred. And he suffers from a self-imposed desire for revenge, that he, the, the, the straw that breaks the camel back he he puts up with it, he puts up with it, he objects to it, he objects to it, and suddenly one thing turns him, that his daughter sold a ring that his wife gave him. I would not change it for a wilderness of monkeys. And now this need for revenge, a kind of hubris, brought on not... Not because he is he, he is by, by nature, like Lear or, or Tamburlaine or any of the others, or Oedipus. Not because hubris is in, inherent within him, but it is brought on a sense that his need for justice and his belief in justice will make things right. It's a kind of hubris. It is a kind of, well, I'm right and they're wrong. And I must prove them right because I deserve justice and justice will serve me. And of course it doesn't, which is why it's a comedy. Because it is an absurd, topsy-turvy world where that which is right is not that which happens. And Shylock becomes, as I say, a tragic victim in this absurd comedy of human behavior. There were other writers who would take the, um, the classic Greek themes, uh, for instance, Racine, who tended to write long, very wordy plays that can be, as, can be very tedious sometimes if they're not done well. Uh, he wrote a Phaedra um, out, out, of the, uh, out of the Greek canon. Um, 
all of these Renaissance and post-Renaissance writers stole from the Greeks. Shakespeare also did it in terms of, of comedy, let it be said, because he borrowed from, from Plautus, um, just as Plautus borrowed from the Greeks. It was like a, a channel down which these plots and these storylines and these, these satiric principles would travel. Um, and if you look at, for instance, Shakespeare's Comedy of Errors, it, it could be Aristophanes. Um, it is Plautus. He stole the plot of Comedy of Errors from a play by, uh, by Plautus. Um, he, uh, the, one of the quotes uh, that I, I researched, Shakespeare feeds Elizabethan life into the mill of a Roman farce. Life um, realized with its his distinctively generous creativity is very different from Plautus' tough, narrow, resinous genius. So where where Plautus would take a a a, a, a plot based on a, on a theme from Greek theatre and turn it into a, what we might describe as a rough comedy, Shakespeare refined it and turned it into what we understand as Elizabethan comedy. And the Comedy of Errors is a Greek plot. It parallels the plot, um, both in terms of what happens and in terms of the characters. Um, so it, un, absolutely, unquestionably, it is a play by Plautus rewritten by Shakespeare. As I say very frequently, Shakespeare never came up with an original storyline in his life. Um, uh, and uh, to quote the uh, the wonderful Peter Schickler, don't call it plagiarism, call it research. Um, Shakespeare, uh, Plautus, for instance, in his play has a lord and his servant. Shakespeare had two identical twin lords and two identical twin um, servants. So you might say, well, Shakespeare had an original thought. No, he didn't, because he stole that from a different play of Plautus, uh, which also had twin masters and twin servants. Um, this, by the way, that once he got into this, once he got hooked on the idea of doubles and twins and things, he used it a lot. For instance, um, Twelfth Night. All these ideas are traced back, not just simply to Plautus, but way back to the Greeks. The same idea of human behavior and human interaction is the same fundamental storyline, just being retold, reinvented, reimagined, but not new. It's always been there because people don't change. Um, one important point that as playwrights, as modern playwrights succeed uh, other modern playwrights who become ancient, uh, the new thinking always introduces new current behavior, new current attitudes. For instance, what the Romans would never have done would to be a tribute, and I'm doing this from research as well, the, 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 the Romans would never have attributed things to uh, magic or mystery or mis you know, things like that. For instance, you, know, you wouldn't get Plautus and Terence attributing events to witches. But at the time Shakespeare and his contemporaries were writing, witches were completely believed in. They believed, I mean, the king, James, James I, had, had uh, uh, published the, the, the Hammer of the Witches, uh, a book about how to identify a witch and what to do with her, usually a her, when you found her. So when Shakespeare wrote his witches in Macbeth, most of his thinking audience may have questioned their veracity. But most of the groundlings paid a penny to get in would have went, yeah, 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 they're real. So when I say it is always the same story, when I say it is always the same theme, it is addressed in a modern way. And if you like, Shakespeare's witches were a modern embellishment of an ancient theme. Um, so, you know, if you look at uh, uh, plays like Twelfth Night or Midsummer Night's Dream, the, the thematic may be modern in terms of how it's presented or the additional pieces of information dropping in, but the fundamental underlying theme goes back 2,000 years. And the story of Midsummer Night's Dream could have been written 
just as efficiently and just as well, and probably was, by a, a Greek playwright. There was one other major influence that the Greeks gave, and not a playwright, but a poet. And his themes, and I'm not going to go into them, but I do recommend you read Ovid's Metamorphosis. Um, it is, um, it was written, it's written in Latin. Um, it is a narrative poem in the same way that Homer's um, uh, uh, Iliad and Homer's Odyssey were narrative poems drawn on by the Greek playwrights and by later playwrights. Uh, Ovid's Metamorphosis from, 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 uh, from the Roman perspective was this magnificent, complex, beautiful, um, what had been described as a chronicle of the history of the world from creation right down to the point of, right down to Julius Caesar. Um, and in it, Ovid addresses in exactly the same way all those basic traits of human frailty, the absurdities of human frailty, the tragedy of human frailty, uh, in this one single poem saying, this is how the world happened. He was influenced in exactly the same way by the same thinking that came out of Athens and other, other Greek cities. But Metamorphosis had, had a huge influence on Western writing, Western culture. Um, Dante based a lot of his work on, on uh, Ovid's Metamorphosis. Uh, Boccaccio, um, who wrote the Decameron. Chaucer was deeply influenced by Ovid and Shakespeare was influenced by Ovid as well. And again, Ovid was influenced by the Greeks. So that line of progression is constant throughout writing history. Um, and indeed, Ovid has not just influenced playwriting, theater, he wrote his influence novel writing, he's influenced physical art like sculpture and painting. He found through Metamorphosis, and I do recommend read it, read it, read it, um, he found a, a methodology of looking at human development. I mean, the creation stories, I mean, how many creation stories are there throughout literature and throughout art and throughout religion? Who knows what to believe? I believe science, but that's just me. Um, but whatever about the creation of the physicality of the universe, the development of, of, of human behavior and human tradition has been best exemplified, not just by historians, but by poets, but by writers, but by actors. And within the metamorphosis, you will find the root source material for so much in, in theater that came after that, in what we might call modern theater, and certainly modern theater from the Elizabethan age. So how, um, how has that influenced more modern writing? Um, I believe it, 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 it is still <clears throat> as pertinent today as it has been over the last two and a half thousand years. There is nothing new under the sun, not even fashion. Um, and technology is, developments in technology are just ways of doing things slightly better than the way we did it. 10, 20, 30 years ago. Um, I mean, there were certain advantages to that. Like 30, 40 years ago, nobody ever said, I can't find my phone. It was sitting on the hall table the way it always was. Um, so we haven't necessarily, we've made it you carry it around, but we haven't actually improved on anything. Modern writers are still dealing with the same human condition. The influence, whether it be direct or indirect, is still the same. And I'm going to use a couple of Irish writers because, as I say, we are the Irish in Classic Theatre Company. Um, now, I'm going to start with folk drama. Um, we introduced to Pittsburgh for the first time a few years ago the writer, Irish writer John B. Keane. Now, John B. was a man from Kerry who was a born and natural 
Yes, I also agree with you there. Um, in fact, read anything by Ovid. Sorry, just sidebar. Come back to John B. Keane. Um, he was, to my mind, and, and I, I knew I knew the man and met the man and, and talked with the man, and he was a natural shanahi, a natural storyteller. But he wrote plays, folk plays, plays about what um, uh, poverty in Ireland back in the earlier part of the 20th century. And his plays were tragedies in the Greek sense. Um, we've presented a couple of them um, uh, here in Pittsburgh. Um, if, you, if you take his play Sharon's Grave, which is a fantasy and involves fantasy story underlying it, it's, 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 it is very Greek in that sense, but it is a tragedy. And it is the, again, there is a tragic villain in it um, who is also a tragic victim, somebody who is evil because of his need to survive. That is a very strong um, theme from this, this notion of uh, the fundamental behavior of human beings. A need to survive can turn you bad. It's part of the, the evidence that Greek thinking, Greek philosophy, Greek poetics has taught us that, uh, and in, in Sharon's grave, you have a, a wonderful example of somebody who is a cripple, who can't walk, who depends on a brother to carry him, and who needs who needs desperately to have a place of his own, to be able to be independent, to be free. And in order to do that, he would kill if he could. And that's tragic. And he ends up being killed because that is a tragedy. But that that the human behavior within that play, understood by John B, goes back two and a half thousand years and way beyond. It is part of human culture. It is part of human behavior. Intrinsic evil, I think, is a very, very rare commodity. People become evil for very describable reasons, and the Greeks understood this. In another of his plays, Saiv, uh, uh, that involves a, a young girl being sold into a marriage. It's awful. It's terrible. A young girl being sold literally to an older man as his wife but why because the aunt and uncle who care for her are poor they have no money they cannot survive and the only commodity they can sell is their niece and there's the tragedy the tragedy is not just the tragedy of Sive, the girl the tragedy is of her aunt and her uncle and her grandmother and everybody else involved and the, even the evil matchmaker who is setting this up needs to survive, needs money. So human survival makes us do terrible, terrible things. Take that all the way back to the Greeks. Medea, in order to survive, must leave Jason and ends up making the impossible but appalling choice of killing her own children to survive. It's human, it's human nature, it's human behavior, and it's been the same story for two and a half thousand years and probably several thousand years before that. We only have it first documented by Greek poets and Greek writers. In his play, The Year of the Hiker, um, again, a, a family living in basic poverty and the father one day just got up, walked out and left, hiked. And then one day he comes back and all the questions about his leaving, about the responsibilities, about the sufferings, about the hatreds that build in the family are there clearly, precisely laid out by this Irish folk dramatist. But it occurred two and a half thousand years before with Aeschylus. And so I'll come to another play uh, possibly the one of the greatest Irish playwrights of, of the latter half of the 20th century was Brian Friel. And his plays, such as translations, we talked about Friel. Uh, we had a, a seminar about a year or so ago with, uh, with Matt Tony talking about uh, translations and Philadelphia Here I Come. But he wrote a rather interesting play called Living Quarters. Um, and it's set in the home of a soldier 
and a particular day when that soldier who is a commandant in the army which is the equivalent i think in most armies of major somewhere between major and colonel and he returns home from a very successful united nations mission in the middle east and he has children from his first marriage and he's also got a young wife now it's not a direct copy or a translation but rather like john b keen's year of the hiker it is deeply profoundly influenced by aeschylus agamemnon you can see it it's so clear because it is that same particular uh, dilemma that occurs when the, the when the hero or if you like the villain returns and everybody's been dealing with it everybody's been coping with it and that very return causes an upheaval causes questions to be asked causes doubts to occur and the result is genuinely usually tragic either tragic for the returning hero or tragic for those who are there when he returns and Friel's play goes even further um, the play is told through flashbacks and there is a narrator who in Friel's play is called Sir and this narrator acts as a kind of an arbiter and a director of the action sort of making sure uh, asking questioning the characters um questioning their memories making sure that their memories actually reflect reality and this is a very distinct nod to the notion of the greek chorus in greek tragedy and just as with um the aeschylus plays living quarters deals with having to accept responsibility for your actions um, and the consequences of your actions and the punishment that your actions create. But remember that, that thing I just said there about um, ensuring that the character's memory of reality is accurate, which is part of what the function of the Greek chorus does. I'll come to it again in a second. Um, when, when, by the way, when uh, when Friel's uh, Living Quarters was first staged, it didn't get a great huge reaction, but slowly as time has gone by, people begin to realize and understand the depth, the profundity of this play. Um, what I do find delightful is one of the most um, um, successful revivals of it was by the Greek National Theatre, and I think the Greeks recognized exactly what they had there. Now, I mentioned this notion of the chorus or the chorus character ensuring that the memories or the accounts of past um, were accurate. Uh, one of the greatest, to my mind, modern Irish playwrights is Marina Carr. We did her play Woman and Scarecrow here uh, a few years back. And to my mind, and to mind of most, I think, she, um, she is so profoundly influenced by this by this this greek tradition um and i do recommend if you want to read an irish play or i get her plays and read them they're quite wonderful um when we did woman and scarecrow uh which is a, a, a complex a, a, a complex play um and almost in its own sense a a, a, a piece of poetic but quite beautiful um you and the, the setup is a woman on the point of death literally the moment of death examining her life going over it talking both in actuality and in memory with her husband talking with an aunt who remembers her from childhood but there is a fourth character in it called scarecrow the characters are literally called woman him auntie R, and scarecrow what is scarecrow who is scarecrow Scarecrow is that chorus, is that Greek chorus, constantly questioning the woman's memories. Scarecrow is, in fact, the woman questioning, do I remember it right? Have I got it clear? Did these things happen? It is a Greek motif. It is a profoundly Greek motif. It is the Greek chorus alive and again and living in late 20th century drama. 
she wrote um, a play, and I'm, I, I, I'm coming to the end of this particular diatribe, but um, she wrote um, a remarkable piece called The Bog of Cats. Complex, beautiful, vast, and intimate at the same time, just like any good Greek play. And another Irish writer, Frank McGuinness, wrote um, a, a program note when it was produced first at the Abbey Theatre. And what I love about it, I'm going to, to, to read you the quote that he wrote in, in, in the program note, um, which was a kind of an analysis of the way Marina Carr writes. But I think it is important. Uh, in this particular reference. He wrote, By the Bog of Cats is a play about sorrow. Therefore, it must be funny. A play about death. So a wedding must be at the center of it. A play about saying things that need to be said. So there will be silence at the end of it. A play about hatred. So love is at its heart. A play whose philosophy is that Carthage must be destroyed, but what happens to the destroyers? This is what the Bog of Cats tells us. Now, I think you know, Frank is a very fine writer as well, but I think that that is the most remarkable analysis of the fundamentals of how tragedy works, something that we learnt from the Greeks, especially that notion, a play about saying things that must be said, which is the whole principle of Antigone. Antigone who, who says, there is injustice here. There is a thing that is not right and it must be said, it must be put right. And the result of her doing so is the silence of being walled up in a cave. It is a, it is a play about sorrow. Therefore, it must be funny because we can only understand a thing if we have something to contrast it with. We can only understand the sorrow of a character if we, if you look at it simply, we understand the appalling tragedy of, of the death of Romeo and Juliet, not because simply of the circumstance of timing, but because we've seen what it was like for them to love one another. If we hadn't seen the joy, we could not fully appreciate the sorrow. If we had not seen the, uh, the freedom and, and exhilaration of a character, you cannot understand the pain at the loss of that freedom and exhilaration. So true tragedy in the Greek sense always will have that contrast within it. When you look at Lear, this play about hubris, this huge play about hubris, there are things in it that you want to laugh at. They are so absurd that the human behavior is so absurd. It is that perpetual contrast that, that comes from the Greeks from that understanding of the basis of human condition. Modern writers, our writers, our modern times, and don't forget, <laughs> plays from the beginning of the 20th century are now old. Modern is today. But when I say modern writers, I'm talking about the 20th century. I've literally rediscovered, uh, re-evaluated the, the, the tragic themes of, of hubris and vengeance um, and that when when acted upon, when those the, the, those themes are acted upon, they will always breed results that damage and even in, uh, destroy not just the victims, but also those that seek the vengeance. As Frank said in his commentary there, Carthage must be destroyed. But what will happen to the destroyers? There is always a price to pay. And that's another part of the the Greek theme of tragedy. The gods, or providence, or whatever you like, another power, will always have the last word. That when vengeance is taken, when hubris brings us to the point when we behave so appallingly that we must be stopped, when vengeance is called upon by the victim, like Shylock, he will suffer, he will pay for it. And those he called vengeance upon will celebrate. Um, the gods will always have that final say. That was a theme introduced by the Greeks because Greek religion accepted the notion of a, 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 of, of, um, 
Olympian gods and gods of one shape, way, form or another, be they evil or good, benevolent or untrustworthy, have always existed in human in, in, in the human psyche. Whatever you do, and part of tragedy, and why it is personal, and what the Greeks understood, whatever you do, you have to pay for. In some way or another, you're not going to win. Which brings me to the old joke, and one of the great truths of human existence. How do you make the gods laugh? Tell them your plan. And the Greeks understood that. So that's that for this week. Now, as a special treat, and because a few people have asked me, um, next week, I'll tell you about next week, but in two weeks' time, I'm going to come back to the Greeks for one more visit. And I want to show, I'm going to talk about the contrast that three writers took to one particular theme. The only extant trilogy we have on it was Aeschylus. But Sophocles and Euripides both wrote, we think, probably trilogies, but we've only got um, a small example of it. And it is the whole Agamemnon story. Um, I'm going to call that particular program The Fall of the House of Atreus. But I want to contrast those three writers and how they tackled particular themes within that story. So that's in two weeks' time. You'll get more information about that on our new improved website, which is all up and running now, thank goodness. Next week, um, we have, uh, uh, you'll probably know or have discovered our Expand the Canon series of playwrights. That's next week. It's called Rachel, and um, there's going to be a live reading of that. There are two performances, uh, 2 o'clock and 7 o'clock on February 27th, if you're in or around Pittsburgh, please, please don't forget you have to book. It's free, but we've got limited seating, so we want to make sure that you've got your name on a ticket on a seat. And next week's webinar, Sharon McCune, my esteemed associate producer, is going to be in conversation about the play with the director, uh, Racine Singletary. And uh, this particular play it was actually it's not new. It was first staged in 1916. It concerns. Uh, basically black love, black joy. Uh, it uh, focuses around the character of Rachel, who's a young black woman in the South, um, very early part of the 20th century, and the question of whether it is wise even to bring children into a world, a world full of bigotry and racism. And uh, because bigotry and racism has damaged her own family. So the play investigates that question. It's rather beautiful. Um, next week, uh, uh, Sharon will be here talking to the director about the play. I do encourage you to tune into that one because it's an, not, not merely, um, it is an important play, but it's a really interesting play. And it raises a lot of questions that are still being raised today. And that's the whole point. And that's why we're looking at it because it is a classic theme simply because tragically it hasn't gone away. So that's next week, and then the week after that, we'll be looking at the fall of the House of Atreus, and then I'll leave the Greeks alone for a good while. Um, I want to remind everybody, again, if you're in the Pittsburgh area, we have our gala coming up. Uh, that's on the 19th of March. Uh, tickets are now available. You can order them on the web on the new improved website. Um, uh, it, very reasonably priced. A lovely evening is promised for all. Um, a thank you again to our wonderful sponsor for this week, Leonie. Thank you so much. And if anybody out there wants to sponsor one of these uh, webinars, just send us, um, let us know. You can email us, um, and we will uh, we will be very grateful to you for your assistance. As I say, the webinars are free. They will always be free. They are always available on our um, YouTube channel. Please subscribe to the YouTube channel and have a look at those. Uh, if you haven't seen the ones in the past, they're all there. You can have a look at them for free. And the last thing I would like to say to you is every donation matters. Uh, it costs money to run a company. It costs money to operate. We have two big productions coming up in the very near future, uh, Beckett's Endgame and Mark Carnegie's Boys in the Band. 
um, between now and and, uh, and June, and we do need all the help you can give us. No matter what your donation is, it matters. And it is your donations that put the plays on the stage. We do get grants, we do get sponsorships, that helps us run the company. But to put the plays on the stage, it's you. So every time you send us a check or make a donation, you become a co-producer of the work we do. And that matters so much to us. Apart from that, thank you for joining me. I hope you have a lovely week.